Our next speaker is Larry Polk. Uh, Larry's from Sutherland, Asheville, and Brennan in Atlanta. He's a commercial litigator and represents broker-dealers, banks, and accountants. Larry concentrates on securities litigation, securities arbitration, professional liability litigation, commercial litigation, and SEC enforcement actions. Larry's here today to give us an overview of the positives and negatives with respect to arbitration and mediation. Please join me in welcoming Larry Polk. Good morning. Uh, all of us that litigate uh, have some familiarity and experience with um, ADR or alternative dispute resolution. It's obviously become a very hot topic um, and uh, it is something that many of us think about uh, in terms of individual cases and uh, relationships with customers. So this morning I'm going to be talking about alternative dispute resolution, both arbitration and if time permits mediation, uh, to give you some of my thoughts in terms of my experience with arbitration over the past 25 years, including the, the pros and cons uh, that you will experience uh, as you go into the arbitration space. Now, arbitration now, it's basically divided up into two areas uh, where it is typically enforced. One is in the area of consumer finance. Uh, and uh, this is an area where it works remarkably well uh, to advance the, the, uh, the interest of the, uh, of the companies, um, and there are two primary cases that came out within this past year, uh, the uh, AT&T versus Concepcion and the CompuCredit case, where the Supreme Court held that companies can use mandatory arbitration clauses in order to prevent class actions. And in the consumer finance space, why that is important is because uh, typically in a consumer finance uh, relationship, if there's a dispute the amount in controversy is so small that the only way that it makes economic sense to litigate those claims is in the class action context. And what the Supreme Court has said is that you can use class, that you can use the arbitration provision to prohibit uh, uh, class actions. What I'm going to be speaking about more to this morning is in the context of commercial litigation, bet the company cases, large dollar cases that go to arbitration. Uh, this past uh, summer, I successfully defended a claim involving $31 million in damages and against an investment advisor that went before arbitration, before three arbitrators uh, in a FINRA arbitration. And that can be a very scary proposition uh, for the reasons why I'm going to talk about uh, now. Now, in terms of arbitration, uh, the Supreme Court has obviously held that it is a very strong proponent of arbitration. We have two statutory schemes uh, for arbitration. You have the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, which applies as a matter of federal law, and most of all states have parallel state arbitration uh, uh, codes, which also may apply depending upon issues of preemption. But the Supreme Court, in numerous cases, has held that it will enforce arbitration agreements, that it deems arbitration to be an important federal policy uh, to avoid the time and expense of judicial litigation. Now, in terms of the benefits of alternative uh, dispute resolution, this is probably the reason why most of us would adopt these provisions. Uh, these are the commonly uh, recognized uh, benefits. Uh, you are the architect of the dispute resolution process. Arbitration is a matter of contract. You can contract with the opposing party and design the arbitration process however it best suits your case. So you are the architect. It gives you a great deal of flexibility. Typically, in in arbitration, discovery is limited. You don't go through depositions, which are obviously very expensive and time-consuming. The cost of ADR typically can be, but not all, always, less than court litigation. In arbitration, you get a much faster resolution. Uh, in FINRA arbitration, where I spend a lot of my time, most cases are resolved within 18 months from the date of filing, which obviously is much faster than you would get resolution in a court case. Arbitrations generally are private proceedings. Now, what that means is that reporters can't go into uh, get your file and look at uh, sensitive information, business information, confidential information that ordinarily may be filed in court, for instance, in connection with the motion for summary judgment. So you're able to keep the, the actual controversy out of the public's eye, which can be very important for sensitive cases. And finally, there's a limited right of appeal, which, as I will talk about in a few minutes, can be both a sword um, and a shield, uh, because sometimes uh, things don't turn out so well in arbitration, but you are giving up that right for the most part uh, if you go into arbitration. Now, 
Having gone through all that, you might be asking yourself, well, what could possibly go wrong with this wonderful process? And I've put up on the board um, a decision from Judge Rakoff uh, in the Southern District of New York talking about arbitration, where he gives somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek uh, analysis of his view of arbitration. Uh, that arbitration is touted as quick and cheap alternative to litigation, but e experience suggests it can be slow and expensive. It does have these advantages. Unlike courts, arbitrators do not have to give reasons for their decisions and their decisions are essentially unappealable. Here, Goldman Sachs, having voluntarily chosen to avail itself of this wondrous alternative to the rule of reason, must suffer the consequences. So you don't want to be in that position of having to suffer the consequences. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit is how you can use this process to even the odds. Um, and a couple tips that I'll go through at the end of my speech. You can actually, once again, as the architect of the process, you can make it more favorable uh, to your client. Uh, that can have an important result in terms of the ultimate outcome of the case. The key to arbitration is the selection of arbitrators. Most cases are won or lost based upon the arbitrators that you select. Most arbitrations either have one arbitrators or, depending upon the size of the case, up to three arbitrators. The parties get information about the arbitrators and you select the arbitrators based upon disclosures that they make that I'll talk about in a second. In theory, uh, with arbitrators, one of the great advantages is that you can select arbitrators that have industry background, that know something about your case, that can bring experience based upon their, uh, their, their work in the industry to help resolve the case. But in practice, most experienced arbitrators in the industry are, either are too busy to take a week or two out of their time to hear and resolve a case, or want to be paid for their time, which can make the process very expensive. expensive. You pick these arbitrators based upon their disclosures and you hope that you have fulsome disclosures from the arbitrators. But, as I'll talk about many times, you don't get complete disclosure. And the courts are divided upon whose obligation it is to either make that disclosure or to ferret out information about potential arbitrators. We talk about the arbitrators perform a public duty. Well, for those of us that arbitrate before FINRA, uh, if you go down to Arizona or Florida, uh, we encounter what we call the snowbirds. And these are retirees that want to come uh, hear arbitrations simply because uh, you get a free lunch, uh, you get paid $400, and it gets you out of the house for the day. And more often than not, these snowbirds fall asleep during the hearing. So once again, that is a negative that you need to be aware of. With ADR providers, the rule is you get what you pay for. I just talked about FINRA. Well, the advantage to FINRA is that you don't have to pay much for the arbitrators. They typically get paid $400, maybe $500 per day. Other providers, such as AAA, have a very experienced panel of arbitrators. You may get a, a, a roster that includes prominent attorneys, experienced attorneys, retired judges. Well, the problem with that is that, at least with AAA, uh, you are going to pay for that experience. So with the example that I have of a four-day hearing with three arbitrators, three attorneys, charging $500 an hour, well, at the end of the day, you're going to pay upwards of $48,000 just for their time, in addition to the AAA arbitration administration expense. And in addition to that, then you have your own attorney's fees, your expert fees. So why would you use AAA? Well, because it has a highly trained arbitration pool. It can allow you to use depositions. Uh, it gives you some certainty. Well, the point is, if you're going to pay $48,000 plus fees for that, why not just go to district court and get that same experience with the federal district court judge. The key to picking the arbitrator is the duty to disclose. I'll give you an example of a case that I had where we had an arbitrator that was selected for a panel. The more we looked at his background, just something didn't seem to add up. We went and did a public search on the arbitrator. The public report came back and said that someone with the same name as this arbitrator in the same hometown had a felony conviction. We went back before FINRA. We said, we think you have a problem here. This arbitrator is a felony conviction. He should be disqualified. FINRA came back to us and said, we went and we talked to the arbitrator. He says, it's not the same person, somebody different. So then we had to get a handwriting analysis to show that the person that signed the plea agreement was the same person that had signed the disclosures with FINRA. Then they came back and all of a sudden said, well, this arbitrator has decided he uh, doesn't have the time to hear this case. So we got a new, uh, a, a new arbitrator. But there is a split in the circuits in terms of, in those circumstances, whether the arbitrator has a duty to disclose 
uh, as the Eleventh Circuit says, or other cases, other courts, where they hold that the parties have a duty to ferret out that information. And that can be a very important point uh, if you have to take up an appeal. Because as I'll talk about, there's only four statutory grounds for appeal from an arbitration award under the Federal Arbitration Act. Another important point in terms of appeal is that under those four statutory grounds for appeal, manifest disregard of the law is not recognized as a grounds to vacate an arbitration award in about half of the circuits in the country. Now, while, why that matters is because, once again, remember I told you, you pick your arbitrators, you're on an island with those arbitrators throughout the arbitration process. You cannot challenge an arbitrator's decision based upon their findings of fact. You cannot challenge an arbitrator's decision based upon their conclusions of law. Manifest disregard of the law says that even if you tell an arbitrator, here is the law, and the arbitrator affirmatively says, I see what the law is, but I'm not going to follow it because I'm going to do equity. Well, you would think, certainly under those circumstances, you could get that, that award reversed. But here in these circuits, the courts have held, even under those extreme circumstances, you can't get that award reversed. Manifest disregard is not recognized. Arbitrators have the final word in the arbitration process. If you go into, arbitration pro in, into an arbitration, you need to expect that hearsay is going to be allowed. You need to expect that authenticity is really not a valid objection. Witnesses many times will be allowed to testify by telephone, which obviously impairs your ability to cross-examine a witness through the use of documents or otherwise. Third-party subpoenas. Let's suppose that you have a case where you think there's a very important document that you need to get from a third party. Well, if you're in AAA arbitration, or if you're in FINRA and you're trying to get that document from a non-member, the problem is that an arbitrator may issue a subpoena and the third party just may thumb their nose at it because they don't recognize the authority of the arbitrator to issue that subpoena. So then you have to go into court and ask a court to file, you have to file a different action and ask a, a court to actually enforce that subpoena. And the Sixth Circuit actually has held that under the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, it will not enforce subpoenas issued by arbitrators for pre-hearing discovery. So that's a very important uh, limitation in terms of your abilities in arbitration. Experts. Dalbert is not going to apply to qualifications of experts, for the most part, in arbitration proceedings. And finally, pre-hearing motions to dismiss and summary judgment are generally disfavored. Uh, in FINRA, they actually have a rule that says you can't even file a motion uh, to dismiss until the claimant finishes their case. So just imagine, you might have the best statute of limitations defense in the world, but you can't even raise that until you're four days into a hearing. The, the claimant rests, the panel knows that there's only uh, another half a day or so of testimony, so they're not going to uh, grant a motion to dismiss. They're going to give the claimant their extra day and consider the merits of the case. The experience in the securities industry, uh, it really all started back in 1987, so we've got 25 years of experience this year arbitrating. And when we first started this, when the Supreme Court first said that security claims under the 33 Act and the 34 Act um, are arbitrable, uh, for the most part, we were arbitrating small dollar claims, a couple thousand dollars. Well, now we're arbitrating claims, uh, the case I had earlier this summer, $30 million. Auction rate security cases can be $50 million, $100 million. These are huge cases that are being arbitrated now uh, before FINRA. Over the past 25 years, there has been almost no decisional law under the federal arbitration, under the, the federal securities laws, because arbitrators are deciding these cases with limited right of appeal. So we're dealing with case law, decisional law, that pre-exists 1987. And obviously the securities markets have changed, the country has changed, economics have changed, but we're still, still dealing with a, a case law that was frozen in time 25 years ago. FINRA arbitration is governed by, obviously, by FINRA, which is subject to the SEC. FINRA makes the rules, enforces the rules, vets the arbitrators. Because they're subject to SEC, they're subject to uh, public opinion, they're subject to political pressure. And the plaintiff's bar in the federal arbitration process has really kind of taken over the whole process uh, and has forced FINRA to adopt very plaintiff-friendly rules, such as what I just told you, uh, a prohibition against motions to dismiss. So you have to be aware that if you're going into arbitration in a regulated industry uh, where you have uh, a, 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 a 
uh, an entity such as FINRA or SEC that administers it, they're going to be subject to public pressure. If you ask someone in the securities industry, was it worth it over the pa past 25 years, I think that virtually anyone will tell you, yes, it was worth it. Why? Because you heard Walter Boone talk earlier today about uh, judicial hell, hell holes. Well, the securities industry has avoided the uh, runaway jury verdicts in those hell holes. You haven't had cases go before juries. You don't have huge punitive damage awards. So when you look at the entire experience, the entire experience has been favorable to the securities industry. When you look at individual cases, however, you really have wide divergence in terms of the, uh, the outcomes and the decisions by these arbitrators, once again, with no right of appeal and very limited grounds to vacate a case. Also, when you have mandatory arbitration, the plaintiff's bar knows that virtually any case has settlement value the same day that they file the case. Why is that? Because you can't get it dismissed. There's going to be a nuisance value. There's going to be attorney's fees that you're going to have to experience and incur to defend the case. So they know that once they file that case, that there's going to be a payday for them. And the reasons uh, statistics show that in federal arbitration, upwards of 60 to 70 percent of the cases that are filed in either in an award in favor of the plaintiff or in a settlement. So they know that. They also know that there is very, very low barriers to filing a securities arbitration claim. A pro se litigant can file a claim. You can file a claim just by uh, paying a couple hundred dollars and you're off to the races with no ability to get that case uh, dismissed pre-hearing. So low barriers to entry in terms of uh, arbitration. And there's no Rule 11 sanctions. No matter how frivolous the claim that's filed, it is virtually impossible to get a panel to sanction someone unless you have cost shifting, which I'll talk about in a minute. So how do you even the odds in your arbitration practice? Well, there's a couple pointers that you can follow. And really, this depends upon your ability to em employ these, these pointers, depends upon the nature of the industry that you're in. To the extent that you're in a fiduciary relationship with your customer, it's more difficult to get these types of advantages. To the extent that you're on equal bargaining grounds with your adversary, then it becomes much easier. The first is include a choice of law provision. There are certain states where you just don't want to be in terms of either their, their substantive law or their procedural law. Florida, California are two prime examples. Florida just has some of the craziest decisions you can imagine. There's a decision right now uh, from the uh, Court of Appeals in Florida that says that statute limitations don't apply in arbitration. Go figure that out. That's before the Supreme Court. So obviously you don't want to be in, in, in Florida. You want to be in a jurisdiction that has um, a tort reform statute, um, that has uh, a good uh, contributory negligence law, comparative negligence law, that has the ability to allow a litigant to ask that damages be apportioned even to non-parties. So choice of law. Venue provisions can be very important, if enforceable. Make your adversary come to your home jurisdiction to arbitrate the case. You can do that if you have equal bargaining power. Once again, if it's a fiduciary relationship, it becomes more important. Include the ability to proceed in court that gives you the right to opt out of the case. And don't be afraid if you have a case with a strong statute of limitations or a strong substance of defense not to go into arbitration. And if you have that ability, take it into court and ask a judge to throw the case out using your strong defenses. So using these types of practice pointers, once again, you can try to even the odds, even the playing field, to give you a better opportunity to get a successful result in arbitration. Thank you.